Today we're going to be looking at section 4.8 and 4.9 in chapter 4. So 4.8 is going to talk about the periodic table. And the periodic table shows all the known elements in order of increasing atomic number from left to right. And we're going to learn what we call certain things on the periodic table and classify them. So let's take first a look at metals versus nonmetals and groups or families. So groups or families are elements in the same vertical column. They have similar chemical properties. Periods are going to be the ones that uh, go horizontally and into rows of elements. And the metals and nonmetals are pretty obvious once we look at the picture of a periodic table. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here's our periodic table. And um, with the atomic mass isn't shown on this one, but you notice the atomic numbers are. So you see how the atomic numbers increase left to right. Um, and so on. Uh, we notice that these are considered our, um, the ones in columns are considered our groups or families, and the ones that are horizontal are considered our periods. And when it comes to metals and nonmetals, this dark line is very helpful. So this line right here, underneath the hydrogen, and then you see it appear here, and this is actually what we refer to as something very technical now, so it's called a stair step pretty, uh, pretty much like a stair step. Um, it is not really a very technical name for it, but all of these here underneath the stair step, so everything to the left of the stair step except for hydrogen, and these two last rows, the lanthanide and actinide series, those are all metals. They're all metals. And everything to the right of the stair step, so this is what I'm talking about when I say the right of the stair step, these are all Non-metals. So most of the elements are metals, and they occur on the left. The non-metals are in the upper right-hand side. And the ones that are right here, that are on either side of the stair step, are referred to as metalloids. And they have some metallic properties and some non-metallic properties. So again, they because they're getting close to the non-metals, but they're still on the metal side, or vice versa, they're still on the non-metal side, but getting closer to the metals, they share um, metal and metalloid properties. Previous knowledge has made you uh, aware of some of the properties of metals. These four that they've been categorized into, you have to know for the test. First one, that um, metals are very efficient conductors of heat and electricity, which I'm sure that you already know, especially having a lot of copper wire running throughout your house to take um, electricity to your TV and to your uh, computer and other electronic devices. Metals are also malleable, so that means that they can be hammered into thin sheets. They are ductile and exhibit ductility, which doesn't mean that they can quack or tread water, but they are pulled into wires. And they have a lustrous or a shiny appearance. Section 4.9 is going to talk about the natural states of the elements. Let's look at the natural states of the elements. Most elements are very reactive, so we don't see them normally alone by themselves in nature. Um, the, some of the exceptions that we have are over here. The um, noble gases are group 8. So all of these down through here are noble gases, and that's 8A. Sometimes it's 18A, depending on how it's numbered. If you notice this numbering system, we have 1A, 2A, and then you notice it skips over here to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, some, some will uh, number it 1, 2, and then... 3 through 12 here, and back up here to 13 through 18 here. So um, when they refer to the noble gases, they'll be referring to either 8A or group 18, and that's this last row. We're going to talk about how they have an octet filled, um, so they meet the octet rule, and they're comfortable not to interact and react with some other elements, and that's why they're considered noble, because they don't react with other elements. Some of the others that um, are not very reactive are the noble metals, which are gold, AU, number 79. Um, let's see, silver, which is AG, number 47, right above it. And then uh, platinum. And it's found right here next to gold, number 78. So those three are considered noble metals. Now, they do react um, some, but not much. So that's why they're so um, noble. They don't react very much at all. So we have those and the noble gases. All right, natural states of elements. Here are some others. Some elements are called diatomic, and the reason they're called diatomic is because they don't hang around 
in singles that hang around in pairs. Nitrogen is one of them, and oxygen is one of them. If we look over here on the right at this example, this is actually what a chunk of sodium metal would look like. And this is just a drawing of the element sodium uh, just stacked next to each other. So this is sodium metal. It's highly reactive. Uh, you put it in water and it bursts into flames. This Erlenmeyer flask has chlorine gas in it. And chlorine gas is diatomic. So you'll never see chlorine by itself. It's in pairs with itself. So these are chlorine molecules here. If I were to open this and these two were to react together, what would happen is the chlorines would come apart and they actually would accept an electron from a sodium atom, each one would, and it would cause an ionic compound to be formed. This ionic compound over here, if you notice, is something pretty common and it's called table salt. And you eat that on a daily basis, but it started off as the sodium metal that's explosive in water and chlorine gas that if you inhaled it, it would kill you and through a chemical process forms sodium chloride. So nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, chlorine gas, those are three examples of diatomic molecules. I want to point out the other ones on the periodic table to you. I like to call these the Magnificent Seven. Um, and if you look at the pattern, I think it'll be easy for you to see how you can keep them separate. Hydrogen is considered a diatomic atom. It does not uh, either does not hang out by itself very well, I guess you could say. It has to be connected to something. Um, so if you find it alone in nature, you're going to see it written as H2. So let's look at the others. If we look over here, it starts with nitrogen. And it goes like this. Maybe you can see why I refer to them as the Magnificent Seven. All right, so we have hydrogen, which is one, nitrogen is two, oxygen three, fluorine is four, chlorine five, bromine six, and iodine seven. So these are never found in nature alone. They're always found either connected or uh, chemically bound to another element or to another atom of itself. So we were always going to see these in nature as N2, as O2, as F, Two, Cl2, Br2, and I2, and H2, or they're going to be chemically bound to another one of the elements. So they're called diatomic. You have to know them for the test, and it's not one of those things that you can just learn it and let it go. Um, this is something that's going to, you're going to have to remember um, for the rest of the chemistry class. This is a table from your book, and it just shows you the elements that exist as diatomics. And this tells you what they would look like at 25 degrees Celsius, which is a standard temperature, and the, how you would write them as um, a diatomic molecule. So remember that you need to memorize these and to know these for the test. That's all there is for this lecture.